Um, so this is kind of an experiment. It's a workshop. It's the first time we ever did this uh, during a, a Joomla conference. So it's uh, kind of new. Uh, it's also for you guys new because you, you didn't bring a laptop either or you did uh, bring a laptop. Uh, you have a laptop, you, neither. So w we need to figure out what's, what's interesting. Maybe after uh, the introduction, uh, we can have uh, a small, uh, and TJ comes in and says, says something. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we, we need to figure out like what is interesting. Um, well, first of all, the, the slides are available online already. So uh, whatever is, is on them, uh, you can look it up uh, later. Um, well, my name is uh, Jis Reitsma. I'm from uh, the Netherlands. Um, I own a little company called uh, Yerio, and I'm um, uh, doing development trainings, and I'm uh, also uh, uh, developing extensions for Joomla. Um, plus, I wrote a little book, and basically, based upon the book, we can see like what's interesting to deal with uh, for the upcoming two hours. Um, I'm also a part of the Zend uh, Z team. Zend, uh, Zend, that's the, the founder of uh, PHP. Uh, that's the company behind uh, PHP. For instance, PHP 7 uh, came out because of their, uh, their effort. And I'm uh, part of a voluntary team promoting uh, Zend a little bit. And I'm uh, sometimes also an untrained uh, idiot on a bike. I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just stepping on it and see what's, uh, what's happening. So th the workshop was actually uh, about you writing the plugins. Uh, and me just guiding you with it, but that's that's the first question mark, like a laptop, because not everybody brought the laptop uh, with them. Um, that's uh, coming up later, so after the slides, we'll, we'll have a short round of uh, what you guys want to do, basically. Um, what I came up with was uh, 10 different scenarios to work upon uh, while building a, a Joomla plugin. Um, but maybe before we, we start off, first like a, a, a small question round, um, who of you uh, is familiar with PHP development? So not everybody. <laughs> who has ever written a Joomla extension? No. Modified the Joomla extension? Uh, yeah. Most of you. Uh, huh? I'm not exactly, yeah, <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, so th the 10 scenarios I came up with are already pretty advanced. So we'll just have to figure out, maybe we, we pick one and just see like how, how we go along with, uh, with that. Um, plugins always work in a similar way. So uh, a plugin is always a, a two-step model where you need a plugin class, which is bits of PHP. Yeah, cool. Um, and an XML file. So that's maybe also the bits we can uh, uh, deal with later on. Um, in practice, just look at the code and discuss it a little bit, like how it's working. Um, so for the 10 scenarios, actually for all of them, the, the same scenario pops up, uh, create a skeleton of, of a plugin. Um, the downside is actually that, that the first step is also to create a folder structure. And every plugin is always belonging to a certain plugin group. So uh, if you start with a content plugin, it's uh, going to be a different folder structure than with a, con uh, a system plugin or an authentication plugin. So it depends a little bit on what kind of plugin you're going to write. Um, but then there's always an XML file and there's always a plugin class. Um, I'm going through first uh, the scenarios. Well, I, I think it's going to be less useful to us uh, today. Um, but this maybe also gives you a glimpse of what you can do with Plugins. So this is just some fun stuff, uh, stuff you can do with plugins. Um, so one of the first uh, plugins I've, I've also, also written uh, in the past was just simply a plugin that is uh, going to trim the title. It's, it's going to modify the title. Um, it could do that upon display time. So whenever an article is going to be displayed, uh, it's going to be loaded from the database. And before it's put on screen and after it's being loaded from the database, so in between, you could trim the title, remove spaces from the left side and the right side. Um, another mechanism would be actually to do that same thing while it's saved to the database, because that way the plugin only needs to run one time when you're saving the article, uh, while when displaying the article, it's already corrected. So th there's two different scenarios basically to modify things with an article. One would be before you're, data, uh, you're, you're saving it to the database, and the other one would be before you're displaying the article on screen. 
and either scenario would be done uh, using a content plugin. So this is specifically plugins that do something with uh, content, and content could be a menu item, content could be uh, a certain form, uh, it could also be uh, an article. Completely different um, uh, scenario, but more or less in the same atmosphere or the same, um, same surroundings. Uh, adding a new article field. Um, within Joomla, a lot of the fields, or actually all the fields uh, in forms, are generated through a principle called uh, JFORM. So JFORM is the underlying basis of how to create a form in Joomla. And every time when there's JFORM, basically you start off with an XML file generating the uh, eventual HTML code that is generating the, the HTML form. Um, so what you could do is write a plugin to modify whatever form you want to modify. Um, and one example would be to just to add a, a single field to an edit article uh, form. And you would do that again with a content plugin. So the previous example was actually to modify things in an article while it's being saved to the database. Uh, there's also uh, the option to uh, do something with the article before it's being displayed. But this is actually um, a content pre pre prepare form um, event that is being generated um, for you to modify the form, which is just another way of displaying content. So from the minds of, an, of a developer, uh, this event still belongs to the same group of article events. Well, actually, from the end user point of view, it's, it's kind of a different thing. It's, it's not displaying data, it's actually displaying a form which is displaying the data. But it's still uh, possible to do that with uh, a content plugin. Um, third one is completely different. It's an authentication mechanism. Um, I'm not sure if, if somebody already says, like, hey, I want to play with uh, plugins and I want to do something with this auth authentication procedure. I just came up with uh, a remote authentication procedure, created a little script on a development uh, URL. So, um, where's my mouse pointer? So, um, this link uh, is simply a script that is requiring some kind of input. Uh, there's going to be a parameter uh, CMD command uh, which is either out or help. And then if you append uh, to the command out uh, a username foo or uh, and a password bar, then the authentication works. And if you put in anything else, then it doesn't work. So would this scenario apply to if you wanted to act directly instead of out of box Joomla? So theoretically, yes. But my script is not Active Directory. Um, and the cool thing actually about Active Directory, it's already supported through existing Joomla plugins. Um, but it shows how the authentication works. So actually with uh, Joomla authentication plugins, this is one sample that you, uh, that you could use not to authenticate with the Joomla database or with Active Directory or with Gmail, but with your own mechanism. Um, and now the mechanism is just really stupid because there's only one set of password, uh, username and password, but it was just a, a dummy example. It again also shows you uh, what, what you could do with uh, plugins. So it's, it's like a wide diversity of different scenarios that, that are, are, are all boiling down basically to code within a plugin. Um, this is one of the most complex examples, uh, Finder. Finder is actually the technical name for smart search. So in uh, Joomla there's this difference between uh, the regular search and smart search. Uh, the main difference is actually that uh, regular search is uh, directly searching for keywords in the database. Uh, so whenever you add an article and you do another search, uh, that article will be included in that search. With uh, smart search, with Finder, actually the mechanism is to create an index first for every article that you have. So instead of actually searching for the articles in the database, it's being searched for in a specific index table, and that's the Finder mechanism. So the finder mechanism is allowing you to um, basically collect all the data that you want to search, thro search for uh, from different kinds of resources and put them into a different uh, finder database table with the benefit of performance, with the benefit of more customization. And what you could do with a finder plugin is a lot of different things. Um, but one of the things you could do is add a taxonomy to existing content. And what is taxonomy? Uh, it, well, 
categor categories are a certain type of taxonomy. You could say that uh, the author is also a kind of taxonomy, so that you could find all the articles belonging to a certain kind of author. Uh, but it could also be a, a new taxonomy, and that's the purpose of this thing. But let's keep it as a, at theory, because this, this example is actually one of the most complex. Um, the fifth one is actually uh, really useful as well. It's what I do uh, a lot of times actually with uh, plugins, replacing tags. So I come up with uh, a certain scenario that I need to add a lot of content uh, dynamically in my articles. And instead of copying and pasting all the, the, the content over all my articles, I simply add uh, a simple tag to the articles. And then the tag could be dynamically replaced with whatever content I want. So, for instance, the dummy tag could actually be uh, translated into a full text article or a specific JavaScript effect or something. Um, and I could do that by adding the tag to articles and then have a system plugin uh, render the whole page. And when the, the page is actually rendered and the, the dummy tag is actually encountered, it's being replaced on the fly with uh, something like this. Um, Anybody of you ever heard of the no number re-replacer extension? So th this would allow you to build that without actually his extension. Uh, his extension is really flexible, um, but still it's like a, a complex thing maybe for a, a really small task. And when sh once you get like the hands on, on a simple base plugin like this, um, you can simply add your own plugin with a, uh, with a little bit of coding instead of relying on a big chunk to uh, uh, extension like his. So it, it, it's an ID, but then you could also use his extension. <laughs> um, this is another one which is uh, really difficult also uh, to create. Um, actually, my book also has a chapter on, uh, on how to do this and uh, explaining all the steps. Um, typos could be made in a certain URL. Um, so instead of content, it, it, it might be content. Um, and then if you want to replace that, that typo in a URL, you could use a system plugin to do that automatically. Um, then there's different events actually that you could use uh, to, to do that. The on after initialize event uh, is a certain event that is always kicked in uh, when uh, uh, the, the page is being started. So then the URL is known and then you could scan the URL for certain typos and then replace them uh, automatically. Um, Another one could be uh, the whitelisting of emails. So let's say you want to have user authentication or user registration available, but instead of actually allowing everybody to register, you only want, to want people to register with a specific email address or uh, an email address ending on a, a specific uh, email domain. Um, well, that's not something that is existing in Joomla. It's also allow or requiring you to actually have a specific kind of logic in your own company or for a specific customer, but it might be useful. So whenever actually a customer or a user is being saved to the database, you could use the on use save before event to actually intercept that change, intercept that user registration and check upon uh, whether the user email address actually matches your, your rules. And then whatever rules uh, deny that creation of user, uh, this user plugin allows you to stop the whole registration process. Um, another scenario, and we're almost there because I only had uh, nine, or actually ten, but that's like a little bit of mumbo jumbo. Um, some kind of jQuery effect. That's another good reason to uh, to add a, a plugin. Uh, a lot of times when I need uh, things like fancy box or some kind of light box effect. Um, there's also the jQuery UI uh, library, which, which is containing a lot of uh, cool effects. Instead of actually looking for some kind of third-party extension that is adding that, and it's al also adding a lot of fluff that I don't need, I actually create my own plugin because it's only a couple of lines of code to do that. Um, so this might also one, uh, might, might be one example that I'm just taking with, uh, with you guys and just showing you, like, uh, I, I've created a couple of plugins. They're all online with GitHub. So we can go through the code and just see like how it's, uh, how it's working. Um, this is also a funny one. Uh, it's a pointless example, but it's, uh, it's nice to see that it's actually possible. Um, so there's, there's the mission uh, statement of uh, having an extension uninstalled once it's installed. Uh, 
uh, completely pointless, of course, because it's some, some kind of security principle which is not really secure. And it's also um, really hard to, to undo maybe this kind of uh, tricks. But it's possible. And it shows you actually that there could be a system plugin doing something with extensions once they are installed. So of course, first you need the system plugin to be working. But once it's working, maybe you could use that to uh, block the installation of specific kinds of uh, extensions. So maybe you want to uh, have the system plugin installed, and then uh, you're, you're disallowing other extensions of a certain type to be installed afterwards. Um, it could be in a scenario. Uh, there's, there's multiple scenarios. So, so this basically shows you yet that you can do something with PHP whenever an extension is being installed. Um, and this is basically slide 10 or scenario 10. You can do a lot of different things. Um, I don't know if you've uh, heard of the name Peter Martin. Well, some of you are really familiar with him. Or some of you are also really familiar with all his talks with Raspberry Pis. He's going to do a talk uh, tomorrow, I think, um, showing you actually how to connect uh, Joomla to a Raspberry Pi in some kind of way. And that some kind of way is, is changing with every time when he buys a new device and, and plays with new technologies and so on. But it also shows you that you could actually uh, write a plugin to do something in PHP that is communicating with his Raspberry Pi. Unfortunately, his Raspberry Pi is not turned on yet, I think. So uh, <laughs> we, can't, we can't connect to it or whatever. Uh, but it's, it's also showing you, again, the flexibility. Um, Removing swearing words from content, that's kind of some kind of filtering mechanism that whenever users are allowed to upload content, you could use, again, uh, uh, a, a content plugin to modify that kind of content um, or override a class file. Um, so actually, this is just a, a bunch of scenarios. Um, and before I continue, actually, with uh, maybe diving into some of the practicalities of creating a plugin in general, um, none of you have created a plugin before, correct? Tried. Tried. <laughs> cool. So um, this was actually the experimental s part of this this workshop. <laughs> like, uh, who's going to attend? Uh, what are we going to do? And actually, instead of doing this stuff, um, I think it's it's worth less actually to do something if you've not created a plugin before because you guys actually want to learn how to create a Joomla plugin. Well, first of all, uh, you should have received my book. So that's step one or step one till 90. <laughs> Uh, that's showing you like a lot of di different things and uh, what we can do in the upcoming two hours is only take a, a couple of those scenarios and uh, see where it goes and, and see like how the, the plugin could be created. So I'm, I'm going to forget about this part and just moving ahead. Um, the rest of the slides were a couple of thoughts I, I put down for um, that, that might be useful when creating a plugin. Uh, so those Slides are still useful, but they're not showing any actual code. And I think what we're going to do on screen is just display code later on, display the, the kinds of stuff that you can actually do with plugins and see where it's, uh, where it's uh, ending up to. Um, so where to begin with a plugin? Um, the most important thing is always, first of all, you need to choose your plugin group. A plugin is always belonging to a certain kind of group, and I will later on explain the, the relation actually between the group and the events that are attached to it. So that's the basics of, of uh, choosing which group uh, or d choosing the right group for your plugin. Um, when you made that choice, actually, the choice sticks because the name of your class, in this case, uh, PLG system example, so system is the name of the plugin group, um, is going to it's going to determine like the workings of your plugin. So this is really one of the fu most fundamental steps you're always going to do. And it's going to be also difficult in the beginning to determine what kind of group is actually needed for what kind of functionality. I'm going to display also uh, uh, a small trick actually when choosing the right group. So I'm, I'm coming back to that. Um, after that, what I always do is create a class skeleton. Um, I asked before, like, how, how familiar are you with PHP programming? But not, not all of you are that familiar with PHP. So I'm also going to introduce uh, a little bit about PHP development in general. Um, 
Who's familiar with PHP development again? Uh, Object-oriented programming? Uh, the difference between protected and private? It was just a little test, but just to make sure like what kind of knowledge you already have. So that, that might be less, less useful for you guys, but it's, well, we're, we're doing it together, so we just need to figure out like, uh, what is interesting. Um, what I do always with a plugin is not create uh, a class with methods, um, but I always create an empty class without any methods. Because afterwards, I can create an XML file. And if I have the empty class and the XML file, I can discover, uh, I can discover the plugin itself and have it installed in Joomla using the extension manager. And from there on, I actually have a plugin that is enabled with zero functionality. But because it's enabled, I can go back to the code and test out, like, hey, but what if I do uh, this kind of methods in, in the plugin and then look at the front end or the back end, like what, what, what the effect is of that, that change. So this is always like the first uh, steps. Um, these are the first steps I always take. Yeah. So what happens? Yeah, it's not really bad, but the only thing is then you have to move it. Um, because if. Well, I'm, I'm coming back to that later on. Okay. But if you're going to write a content plugin and you've put it actually into the user folder, um, the, the general concept you should have is that it's not going to work. I'm going to explain you later on why or why it's actually still working. <laughs> so <that laughs> it's like a fuzzy answer. But it's, um, so, so it may not work. It may not work, and that's the problem. And, and then. Would I, would I know that's the problem? Nope. Nope. So that's, that's, again, also the, the difficulty. Um, I create a little problem with the mic, but um, I'm going to take off my jacket, but that's fine. Uh, yeah? Yeah. And I'm going to I'm, I'm I'm going to explain like the difference in folders in a, in a minute or so. Cool. Um, diving a little bit deeper, um, we're going to do object-oriented programming, or well, we're we're going to, but we're attempting to do that. And uh, there's a few guidelines also with uh, object-oriented coding. Um, and that is actually, you have to think about the code and you have to think about what kind of methods and what kind of uh, variables, your variables you're going to create uh, within your own code. Um, now, one of the pro problems there is that, that if you're new to this kind of things, um, you're also going to choose the wrong names. And, and every time when you pick a wrong name for a th certain method or a certain class, you always can rename it. But this is one of the base tricks that I still use after um, about 14 years of PHP programming. So that's uh, no, even longer. So I'm, I'm still picking like the first rule there, the first bullet here as a, as a guideline. Whenever I, I do create PHP code or code in general, what I do first is write down in, in normal English what kind of assignment I have, what kind of problem am I going to solve. And every time when I have nouns, they become objects and verbs become uh, methods within those objects um, so that actually my code starts to make sense. And uh, the more you do this, the cleaner your code actually becomes and the more useful it actually becomes. The only thing is that you always have verbs and nouns for similar things. So for instance, a customer, in one sentence you would refer to a customer as a customer, but another sentence it would actually be a visitor or a user. Uh, so one thing you also need to do is just uh, uh, bring it down to single words. So uh, stick with one word like customer and never use the word uh, user or, or, or visitor afterwards. And that's the same for uh, you, uh, for words like um, modify and edit, that, that's, that's also a, a similar word. Break it down into uh, uh, different words and, and, and remove all the du duplicates, because then you can translate actually those English words into real life object names and, and method names. Um, another thing is also with methods, that um, whenever you create a method, it could have input arguments and it could have a return value. Um, but just like a verb, uh, a verb is also uh, related to uh, 
but this is where my, my, my English actually stops. Um, Leidend <laughs> voorwerp. So there's a, there's a subject, and uh, the subject does something with the verb, and the verb, uh, there, there's a, uh, an object, th th so the third party involved more or less, yeah. Um, so there's going to be a relation, a relation also, and the verb is, is actually in between the object and the subject um, to begin with meaning actually that, that there's a direction. And the direction actually is also with that there's something go going in, the input arguments, and there's something going out. And by si simply already stating like, hey, but I'm going to create a method, um, and it's going to have a certain input, and it's going to have a certain output, um, then the name of the method again makes sense. So for instance, if you're saying get customer ID, then that's a proper method name, and it's going to return customer ID, but it makes less sense to have input arguments with that. So the more you think about that code, the, co the, the cleaner it becomes, without actually even writing a single line of PHP code. Um, some other bits is that uh, we're, we're going to cover plugins, but there's much more to, to tell about uh, coding. Um, I'm most likely we have time enough also to deal with helper classes. Um, helper classes are, are uh, classes when, when you have, for instance, a plugin class, and the plugin class is doing so many things at once that actually you want to move functionality out because otherwise the, the class becomes too big. Uh, then you could simply add a helper class to offload functionality from the main class into the helper class. So the helper class is just a, a really handy way um, of, of uh, offloading functionality from the original code into uh, such a helper class. Tomorrow I have a talk about um, um, namespaces, and during that talk I will tell you why helper classes are evil and you shouldn't use them. So today we're going to use them, and I'm going to encourage you to use them, but in the end, in, in the end you sh should be thinking about the code in a more thorough way, and that's something for like the advanced talk uh, tomorrow. Um, PHP Storm is like the editor for uh, PHP programming in, uh, in Joomla, and it's also um, recommended to have uh, some kind of uh, GitHub repository, but that also requires you to use Git. So we're going to skip that for now, but it's just a hint that if you really want to dive into programming, uh, using Git and GitHub is also really uh, uh, something you should do. Now, um, for, for the, 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 the practical part, um, I wrote down these links. Um, the slides itself are available under this link. Um, I created a book, and the book also has online code through uh, the GitHub repository that you find there. So there's going to be a couple of code samples in there that might be useful. Um, and, and these slides are prepared. The rest of my talk isn't, so we just need to figure out like, hey, but what kind of thing are we going to see and maybe we're going to, going to pick a couple of examples that are in that uh, GitHub repository. Plus the documentation of Joomla itself is already solid enough to guide you into the basic principles of, of uh, creating a plugin. Um, but basically it's, it's now that you have two different resources, the documentation project of Joomla and my book uh, which is also guiding you with uh, things. Um, we're already like 30 minutes underway. Um, does anybody of you really want to get started with developing something? Or is it fine for you to listen to me for the next one and a half hours? <laughs> listen. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, before we actually can dive into the, into the practicalities of creating a sample plugin with some functionality, we first need to find out what a plugin is and how to use it and what, what are the, the different folders. Um, but yeah, I'm, 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 I think I'm just going to drink a lot of water <laughs> because we're going to do a lot of talking. <laughs> but that's fine, that's cool. Mm. Let me find uh, another slide set which is actually introducing this. Um.
So this is actually another presentation I, um, I created for the Joomla World Conference last year. Um, and the whole purpose was also to introduce plugins in general. So that's, that's basically like the next step that we can take now. Um, and it was also to, to guide you into a couple of steps that, that might be useful. So actually the, the scenarios that I, uh, I, I mentioned before, like the 10 different scenarios or actually nine plus some mumbo jumbo, um, those were, were nice, but they, they required you to know actually a, a couple of PHP code segments um, that might be useful. And actually this presentation is going to create uh, some of that code. So this is going to be like a general introduction of, um, of how plugins work in general and also how to uh, add useful stuff to it that, that might be useful for your first uh, plugin. Um, yep. So um, if we talk about plugins, um, Earlier, I've, I've shown you different scenarios, and I mentioned already like the difference between a system plugin and a content plugin. There's, there's different types of plugins. And actually, if you want to write your first plugin, you have to choose the right group, because otherwise things might get weird. So that's the, the, the best description. Um, and the reason why it might get weird is, first of all, that it's, it's all generated through PHP code. So a plugin is made possible by Joomla, and Joomla is written in PHP. Uh, but the PHP code is all over the place. And whenever the PHP code is doing a certain kind of thing, and that is generating an event, then suddenly Joomla plugins can react on that event. But it just depends on wh where, the where the event was actually generated to what you could do actually do with the plugin. And um, the, the, the previous examples were all showing like the diversity of all those different, different functionalities th that you could, uh, could include. Um, a plugin group is an attempt to organize that functionality. Um, and I, I say it carefully again, it's an attempt, because it, it's sometimes not really succeeding in that, that attempt. Plus, um, what you also need to realize is that it's, it's an attempt to organize plugins, but it's actually also an attempt to organize events. But there might be similar events that you would never actually use in a single plugin. While in a single plugin, it might also be useful to have different kinds of events that co are combined, uh, adding a certain functionality. Now, we'll, I will come to a, a couple of practical examples to make that, that, that point. But now you already know that there's this, this thing called the plugin group. But it's actually a, a little bit fuzzy um, on, on where and when it's actually being used. Um, now, plugins fit into the, the extension types that, that Joomla uh, has to offer. There's uh, components, modules, uh, templates, and libraries. And every time when I have to explain like components and, and mo modules, then uh, I always say that a component is basically building the page. So whenever you have a page within Joomla, it's always one single component that is building that page. While modules might be there on, on the top and on, on the bottom, on the left, on the right, um, adding functionality to that, to that page. But if you remove that functionality, if you remove modules, if you remove the template, still you're always facing a single component that is, that is used actually to generate that page. Um, so therefore, components are always the main functionality. Uh, modules add a menu or, or search box or whatever. Templates are a web design. But then it comes the problem, like, wh what are plugins then? And the best description of plugins is always that they do something under the hood. And that's, again, like, fuzzy and fake and whatever. So um, actually, to, to know what plugins do, you have to get uh, to the real tough part of describing those, th that, that concept of uh, events. Because events actually determine when a plugin is able to do something. Now. Um, Events, we're, we're getting to that because that's already like at the PHP level. Um, before that, first, a, a general overview of uh, the plugin groups. There's uh, a content thing. Um, the content group, I've, I've already shown you a couple of examples that we're using that content group. For instance, when you're modifying content before it's saved to the database, when you're modifying content after it's saved to the database, but, but uh, before it's displayed on screen. Or actually, content which is actually shown through a form, a JFORM XML file. 
Um, it's still content, and actually content is not only articles, it's also menu items, it's also web links, it's uh, modules in uh, itself. Um, so there's a lot of different content in the, in the CMS of Joomla. Authentication is uh, pretty straightforward, so whenever you want to log in, you have to authenticate, so an uh, authentication plugin allows you to do that. A system plugin is more general, so we, we're going to see a couple of event, events that are useful there. Um, whenever we do something with users, there's the option to do something with a user plugin. So that means uh, logging in as a certain user, logging out as a, a certain user, um, saving a user to the database before and after, deleting a user before and after, um, but also user groups. So whenever you do something with a user group, add a new user group, uh, delete a user group, then again a user plugin is, is used to actually intercept that. Um, I already mentioned the difference between search and smart search or finder. Um, there's also a plugin group for uh, captcha, uh, reCAPTCHA as an, ex as an example, Google, Google reCAPTCHA. There's the whole principle of two-factor authentication and within the Joomla core there's two-factor authentication for, um, for Google Mail, I think. Um, so that means that actually you can authenticate using the, the two-factor authentication of Google itself, but theoretically you could add uh, your own two-factor authentication itself. Um, the what you see is what you get editor. So Tiny MCE, JCE, that's, that's an editor plugin in, uh, in its base. And whenever you add buttons to such an editor, that's a button editor plugin or a button plugin or uh, an editor extended plugin or an editor button plugin. So there's a lot of different names actually for the, the second last group. Um, quick icons, the stuff you can add to the dashboard. And the list goes on because uh, third party extensions can also add their own plugins. So uh, Hikershop, Redshop, Furtumart, uh, the different uh, uh, content uh, uh, construction kits, CCKs, um, and there's also two extensions here uh, of myself, Simplist and Dynamic 404. Um, so whatever extension is there, it could add its own events, it could add its own plugins to the whole listing of, uh, of uh, different plugins, groups. So um, we're, we're getting actually to a couple of those events in detail and a couple of those um, uh, plugin groups. And in general, what you could say is that, that an event always belongs to a certain group. Um, that was the way that, that Joomla was, in, in, uh, was, was making those events possible. So if you, if you look at the, 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 three diff or the, the three different lineups, um, content, system, authentication, <coughs> it's equi equivalent actually to the events contained within that group. So on content prepare, in general you could say that an uh, event called on content prepare is always belonging to content be because it's simply belonging to, or it's, it's starting with on content. Uh, the same thing with on user authenticate, on user it's, it's something with a, a user plugin, but now things get weird because it's actually not a user plugin but an authentication plugin. So let me go back a couple of slides. Um, there's the authentication group, there's the user group. But both actually start with events with uh, on user something. So there's on user save before, that's the user plugin. Um, on user authenticate, that's the authentication plugin. So the mapping between a group and the events is not straightforward. Um, basically because the, the name of the event itself is determined by the PHP code. And it doesn't necessarily say what kind of plugins should actually be doing something with that event. Now, to, to, to explain this, um, there's, there's certain PHP code within a component, within the Joomla framework, w somewhere in Joomla. Um, there's PHP code that is generating an event. And whenever an event is being generated, it's basically a message from the Joomla core saying um, this is the moment when certain plugins can do something with it. Um, a plugin on the other hand is a plugin class. So we're going to look at the plugin class in, 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 in basics as well. Um, and every time when a plugin class wants to intercept such an event, wants to do something when that event takes place, it needs to define a method with the same name. So on one end you have the Joomla core or Joomla component that is generating an event called on-content on prepare. 
while on the other hand there's going to be a plugin with a method on content prepare because the name is matching uh, actually Joomla is executing that that plugin method at the same time when the event is being generated um, the problem is there that it's up to the component or up to the place where the event is being generated to come up with the name of that event. And there's some kind of standardization going on that if you have a content plugin, it has an event starting with on content. But now comes the tricky thing. They came up with that uh, standard only recently. And recently is like in the last four years or five years. And before that, they had a couple of events that were um, well, missing that keyword like content and user in, in the, the, the method names on user authenticate. So in, in Joomla 1.0 or Mambo even, it was not on user authenticate, it was on authenticate. And they didn't care about plugin groups. They didn't care about what kind of folder the plugin was living in. It was just an event and any plugin could intercept that event because it was just a generic system event. So again, the, the groups are just an attempt to organize it but it's actually up to the code that is generating the event to do that organizing. Can you buy your own events? Yeah. Like if you write a component that can buy its own events as long as it's following the standards? And then the Th that's actually how the third party plugins do that. Okay. So whenever I'm building my own component, um, I'm, I'm thinking actually along the line, hey, hey, but this is functionality that could be extended. It could be extended by third party developers. It could also be extended by myself. And if I don't want that functionality to be part of the component, I'm generating an event and then I can write a plugin to actually add that functionality. And the cool thing is, is that a component actually becomes flexible through plugins. So if you want to have functionality added or removed, plugins is actually the way to do that. So um, a good component, a good third party extension always has enough uh, plugins available, but if the plugins are not available, it, it should have enough uh, plugin events for third party developers to create those plugins. So um, it's up to the, 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 the developer of the component actually to come up with the right namings of, of uh, events. And the standard nowadays is to start an event always with the keyword on. That means like there's something happening and on that event, on that eventuality, then you can uh, do something. The second keyword is then uh, the name of the group. So content, user, in theory, like also system and authentication, but that's, that's not true for the Joomla core, unfortunately. Um, and then actually some kind of action that is actually happening. Um, so prepare, initialize, authenticate. It's again the verbs describing that, that in that situation something is happening and uh, that uh, in, in that action you can do something with it. There's also a lot of times actually the before and after statement added to that again. So there's on user safe before and on user safe after. Because it might be that on, say, on, on user safe before is actually used to do something with a user to prevent that it's being saved to the database. Or you could also use on user safe after to make sure that whatever you do, it doesn't break the user from being saved to the database, but then you can sync it to an ERP system or remote system or things like that. Um, now, the last line of the slide is actually the most important one. Um, and I've, I've not hinted it yet, but I think you've already seen it and read it and like, hey, but that's interesting. Um, it's, um, it's a clue on how the whole event system is actually working. Whenever Joomla is, is generating an event, it has a single line of PHP code to generate the event. And from that moment on, plugins can, can listen to that event and do something with it. Um, but before doing that, um, most of the time, actually the component generating that event it will import a certain group. So whenever you have the on content prepare, um, uh, on content prepare method or event being generated, actually the, the, the component generating that event will have one step before that, and that is actually to import all the content plugins. And because you know that, um, you know also that by writing a content plugin, you can react on, on content prepare, prepare. Because if your plugin is not imported, it's not active, it's not able to do anything. 
so in another word, um, whenever you have a plugin belonging to a certain plugin group, um, it's only allowed to do something if it's actually initialized. And um, to be initialized, it has to be initialized actually by the component generating the event. And now the standard is actually if there's going to be an event on content prepare, all the content plugins will be activated before that. If there's going to be an on user authenticate event, all the user plugins are going to be activated before that, and so on. So by sticking actually to the plugin group, um, the, the com component and you, you've, you've made a contract that, that whenever the component is generating that event, your plugin is actually activated at that same time. So that's the benefit actually of that fuzzy situation. It's, it's kind of a contract that uh, whenever the component is generating a certain event, the prefixed event group, so content user, is actually initialized before that. Now, there's one special group, and that's the system events. Because system events take place when, um, for instance, the, the system is just initialized. And uh, earlier we had a, uh, an event called, oh, it's right here, on after initialize. So the first step that Joomla is going to take is initialize the system. It's going to load the database. It's going to uh, do a lot of stuff, uh, initialize sessions. And then it will generate the event called on after initialize. But just before doing that, it will initialize all the system plugins. Now, this is the very first event that is happening throughout the whole system of Joomla. And even better, it's always happening, meaning that for on-content prepare and on-user authenticate, um, an, an additional step has to be made by the component generating that event. And that extra step is initializing that specific plugin group. But of one single plugin group, you always know that those plugins are initialized, and those are the system plugins. Because every time when you initialize Joomla, there's going to be the on-after initialize event. And before the on after initialize, all of the system plugins are loaded. Said in a different way, um, using a system plugin, you can intercept whatever event is there throughout the whole system. So if you want to have a plugin event um, in your own plugin called on, con on content prepare, and that's the only thing there that your plugin is going to do, then you're going to write a content plugin. If you're going to use the on user authenticate event, then it's actually belonging to the authentication group, then you're going to write an authentication plugin. But now if your plugin is going to do on content prepare and on user authenticate, and maybe something with search, and maybe add some uh, what you see, what you get button to the, the, the editor, um, if it's going to do all those things, um, you're not going to write different plugins. Now you're going to write a single plugin, and that's a system plugin. Because a system plugin is always working all the time. So actually, the, the, the last line is a trick that allows you to bypass whatever Joomla came up with organizing the events. But it's also dangerous. So my advice is, if your plugin is going to do one thing, make sure that it's fitting into that group that it belongs to. If it's going to do two things, then you could still see, like, like for instance, if there's going to be an on-content prepare and there's going to be something with uh, uh, user saving, then whenever a user is being saved, the form of that user is already loaded. And when a form of a user is loaded, a form is kind of a, a content thing, then content plugins are also loaded. So if you're going to use something like on user save before and on content prepare, then you could still use a user plugin. And that's kind of difficult to understand. So my book is focusing on that specifically, like what kind of events are combined in what kind of plugin. But if you don't care, and if it's a custom plugin and you want to get things working, start with a system plugin. Yeah? So um, order. Order of plugins is important Yeah. Um, and it depends a little bit on the on the mechanism. I'm I'm not sure. Uh, it depends a little bit on what kind of scenarios we're going to look at later on. Well, I mean, but if I, if I create a plugin, yeah. I have it in my list of plugins. Say it's a system plugin. Uh, will it override a authentication plugin? No. So the the ordering of plugins is always um, 
in general. So all the plugins are always not, they're, they're ordered first by ordering number, and then they're ordered by group. But, but so if, if there's uh, two different um, plugins with the same ordering number, then it might depend on the group that is determining the right ordering. But I wouldn't say that that is actually the, the biggest challenge. So if you have such a situation, make sure the ordering is always one, two, three, four, five, and et cetera. Always uh, se sequential. Does one override five and the ID number? No, uh, it's simply by, uh, by the, the, the plugin ordering that you can do in the plugin manager in the back end. Yeah. So that's, um, that's, that's writing down an additional entry for your plugin in the database. And that's the ordering field. Um, and that's actually the primary resource of, of the plugin manager to order all the plugins in line. Um, yeah? Especially with the conference plugins. Historically, you could have conference plugins, but then have the wrong order. So a, a later one would mess something up an earlier one. It's like if you click look in the plugin. Yeah. Then you could close the email address. That wasn't the first one you couldn't do it. So uh, I think that, that's where ordering can play a more important role. In yeah, and uh, there, there's, there's, there's multiple ways. So per area, per thing that you're trying to do, then the ordering makes sense. Um, but I would say that, that only focus on the fact that the ordering is, is one single number per plugin, and then all the plugins are ordered by that, by that number. Um, but whatever kind of ordering goes after that is, is not important. But the ordering is important. For instance, if you have uh, uh, editor buttons, then simply the first, uh, first button to show is actually the plugin with the, the lowest ordering. So it's always ordered from zero, so that's uh, ascending. Um, so then the ordering of the plugins is de or the ordering of the buttons is, is, determining, is determined by the ordering of the plugins. Um, the content thing, that's, that's uh, a really good thing as well. Um, then uh, it might be that one action of a plugin loaded after the first plugin is undoing the actions of that first plugin. So then it becomes really important to note, to note what's going on. Authentication the same way, but then with authentication it's, it's another logic that whenever you authenticate yourself with uh, Joomla, uh, Joomla will go to the authentication plugins and, they will, uh, and Joomla will go through the lineup of all those plugins to, um, to ask the first plugin with your credentials, can, can you authenticate those credentials? And if the answer is yes, then the, 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 the lining up of the plugin stops, so you're authenticated. But then if the authentication fails, the next plugin in line will, will be asked. But then it could be that you're actually authenticating um, against four or five different mechanisms, while the fifth mechanism is actually the one that you're using, and that's performance-wise is, is, is a nasty thing. Um, so there, there's multiple scenarios that, that our ordering is important, but it just depends on what kind of functionality is, is included in the plugin to know like, what the effect is. Yep. And that's the difficult thing again. Yeah. 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 So system plugins are always initialized. Um, a content plugin is only initialized when content is actually dealt with. So yes, that's true. But also, it's it's also bad to to use this trick uh, performance-wise or communication-wise. So um, if, if my plugin is, is grouped in the user plugin group, then I'm, I'm basically stating that my functionality is dealing with users. But if it's not dealing with users, basically uh, the end user doesn't know what kind of plugin they're dealing with. So choosing the right group is also a way of communicating what kind of functionality is included in your plugin. Yeah. It's always good to do it in the content plugin because yep. unless that content is edited or done, like system will initialize it anyway. Yeah, exactly. You cannot even use it. Yeah. And, um, and, and this is one of the, the difficult things I'm, I'm encountering myself as well. Sometimes I, uh, I'm, I'm writing a plugin that needs to be in two different groups. Uh, 
So then, then you need to determine like, hey, but if, if it's uh, both the content group and the user group, can I do it in the content group knowing that content is always initialized before user group? Um, but if that's not working out or if I don't know it, um, I might want to add it as a system plugin. But then performance-wise, it's bad, and communication-wise, it's bad, bad. So then the next step would actually be that I need to make the decision, am I going to do that anyway, or am I going to write two plugins? And it, the, the, the cleanest way would actually be write two plugins. We can look at uh, some of the uh, uh, Joomla core plugins later on to sh show us uh, a couple of examples of the code actually uh, using multiple groups or multiple events in a single uh, plugin group, so that it makes, makes more sense. Yeah? So I understand the ordering, the lower the order, the higher the priority uh, within the group? Yeah. What's yeah. the sequence of the groups as far as None. priority? None. No, there, there's none. So basically, the groups are there as a way of initializing those plugins that belong in that group. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So wh whenever actually, so basically you, st you start off with this huge collection of plugins that are inactive; they don't do anything until um, the 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 system plugins are loaded, and then all the plugins that are belonging to that group are suddenly active. Then afterwards, you initialize all the content plugins, and then then the group simply becomes bigger with all of the uh, content plugins also becoming active. But then the ordering is throughout inactive and active, still the same. So it's it's like a global thing, and the plugin groups, like you said, don't it, it doesn't make a difference in the in the ordering. Yeah, but that's not true. So of the system plugins, you always know that the system plugins are loaded. Um, but then, then uh, if there's, uh, theoretically, um, if, there, if the first system plugin is going to load all of the content plugins as well, so the, the functionality of the, the first system plugin in line is actually to initialize all of the content plugins at that mo moment, then the second plugin uh, in line is not the first or the second uh, system plugin, but it's the second whatever plugin, uh, and that could be a con content plugin. It could be another plugin as well. So it's, it's just the status flag the, uh, being swapped from inactive to active that, that determines whether a plugin is loaded at all. But the ordering of the plugin is always a global thing, regardless of the plugin group. Yeah? Yeah. So um, first of all, that, that's again the ordering. So the, the one with the lowest ordering, if, uh, if all, the, all the plugins are ordered from 0 to 100, and the first plugin is, is loaded with ordering 0, that's the one that's being loaded first. But then the tricky question is actually, what kind of event are they reacting on? Yeah. Yeah. Then the one with the lowest ordering will be uh, uh, rendered first, or d d will be called upon first. But now l let's imagine that they have both the ordering zero. Then it's basically the ordering in the database that is being uh, followed upon. Yeah. No, it's, it's not the, the ID itself. There's, there's a specific field at ordering. And if you, um, if you start to reordering plugins in the plugin manager, um, I'm, I'm actually not sure if I have a working environment here that I can, uh, can show it. But maybe la later on we can, uh, we can show that. Um, but, but in the plugin manager, just as articles, you can reorder all the articles. You can also reorder all the plugins and all the modules. And it's, it's the same way of dealing it with things. And then simply the, the plugin that is loaded in top will also be loaded uh, at first in the front end. Does that answer your question? But, but maybe we can deal with that later on. But um, um, 
for, for time's sake, I'm, I'm, I think I'm just moving forward and just uh, uh, because there's, there's more stuff coming up and then you can see actually like the, the, the situation is even more complex because of the multitude of different events. Um, we're moving forward actually to some code. Um, and then actually the, 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 the matching between the method name and the event name will become clearer again. So here we have two different events on content display before, on user authenticate. There's somewhere some code that is generating this event. And then um, there's going to be a method in a plugin that is actually doing that stuff for real. A lot of talking. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm skipping those slides, but I will come back to, to these later on. But this is just to show you actually the diversity already of different events. So there's going to be different content events. Um, I already mentioned save before, save after, and this is just a list of three, but there's actually a, a dozen uh, or so of, uh, of these events. User events, every time when you uh, save a user uh, before and after, every time when you log in, log out. Now, we're going to focus on, um, first of all, uh, a user plugin, which is going to be located then in the folder called plugins slash user. Uh, we're going to create, uh, or not, we're not going to create anything. This is the standard plugin that is already installed in Joomla. So there's a, a Joomla user plugin um, within a folder Joomla with uh, three files. The, the third one, index.html, you can forget about that file. It shouldn't be there. Um, there's going to be an XML file and there's going to be a PHP file. And the XML file, um, have you ever played with the XML or uh, creating a new template in Joomla? Yes. Also has XML files. Um, the XML of, uh, um, of, of, of any extension basically always looks alike. Uh, and the XML of a plugin um, is only special that it has a different type. So instead of type is template, type is component, it now is type is plugin. Um, plus, it has an extra parameter called uh, the group, which is in this case user. Now, um, before we can dive actually into the PHP code, which is the most interesting part, um, we need to dive a little bit into PHP itself, just to get you guys updated. Um, 30 seconds, but I'm not sure if that's going to, uh, to work. <laughs> um, PHP is an object-oriented language. So that means we're going to work with objects, but actually objects are instances of classes. So actually we don't create objects ourselves. We're, we're going to create a, a plugin class. And that plugin class will be initialized by Joomla into uh, a plugin object. Now that uh, plugin class, so in the end the object will have variables, variables and um, methods. And this is um, a little bit of a sneak preview on the methods and variables that the Joomla user plugin has. So there's, um, let me find my cursor. There's uh, the obligation uh, of a, a defined statement, uh, the security check. This is a class. Um, it starts with PLG uh, with a capital, which is the, the newer standard, um, and user as in the, the name of the group. So whenever we're going to move one plugin from one place to the other, we have to move all the files from one folder to the other, and we have to rename uh, the, cl uh, the plugin class, and which is not that complicated, so you could do it, but it's, well, you never want to undo something. Um, it's extending from a generic class, J plugin, and actually this J plugin class will uh, give this subclass a lot of functionality. So this is also object-oriented programming, um, uh, more specifically inheritance. Um, we can have classes extend upon parent classes, and the benefit is actually whatever is contained in the parent class is also available in the subclass. Now, um, there's a couple of keywords that are, whoop, that are important as well, but no, that was too soon. Um, protected and public, as you can see here. There's also the third um, access modifier called uh, private. Protected means that whenever a value is, a, a variable is called uh, protected, then it's available in the class itself, but also in the parent class and also in uh, subclasses. 
So there's this inheritance thing going on. One uh, class could be extended by child classes, could be extended again by child classes. That's the inheritance tree. And within the inheritance tree, all of the protected members are available to all those classes. If it would be private, then it's only available in the class itself. Now, there's a good reason actually why I made these two um, declarations protected. Because actually the app variable and the DB variable, that's useful to have in your own plugin. DB is referring to database interaction. App is, is useful for, well, doing stuff with the application. And then instead of actually initializing those variables myself, um, I'm relying on the parent class called JPlugin to do that for me. So this is just a declaration of a variable. It's empty. It's not doing anything yet. But by declaring this, this protected app, uh, JPlugin actually knows, hey, but you want to have a fully, uh, fully, fully initialized version of the application within the variable called app. So in my events, in my, in my other methods, I will have access to this app ver variable, and it's going to be a reference to the Joomla application, and it's going to be filled with the right objects and the right calls, thanks to the functionality of JPlugin, thanks to the parent class. Same for the DB, so whenever I do this, I know that I have the application and the database internally available in my other methods. Then in this case, I have uh, four different methods with uh, some uh, uh, input arguments and, and for sure like a return value. And all four, they start with on user, so they're, they're user events. And well, I know for sure that these on user events are working because I'm basically in the user plugin group. So whenever the on user events are being triggered, with uh, the declaration of this method name, I know that this method name will be executed when the event is actually triggered. And because I'm, an, I'm a user plugin, I know also that whenever these events occur, my plugin will be activated by the user component, by whatever mechanism is, is doing this. Um, so, this is a sneak preview of some of the code. I'm, I'm not showing uh, the actual code within the methods. So, so this is actually showing uh, the signature of a class. The signature of a class is always uh, declaring what kind of methods are in there, what kind of input arguments uh, do those methods uh, have, and theoretically, but that's, that's not what you see, um, the return value of each of those events. And actually, there is no return value. The return value is um, pointless in this case. Now, um, I already mentioned uh, this, I think. Uh, the only thing that, that, that I didn't mention was uh, slide up. Um, the last method is uh, starting with an underscore. It doesn't mean anything. It should, should have uh, been there with, without an underscore. Um, but it's some kind of way of saying that the, the underscore, it's an event that is less important to uh, whatever functionality goes on here. Uh, the main functionality is the, the events. So by scanning this code, by scanning the signature, I can find out that, that this plugin is doing something with uh, login, logout, and the user, the, the user creation. Um, but whatever functionality is contained within the getUser method, is something I don't need to know about. It's protected, so it's, it, it's a little bit hidden. It's not public. Um, plus, it's starting with an underscore, basically saying that I can ignore that kind of functionality. Um, because, actually, that, that functionality is either protected or private, I always refer to those methods as helper methods. And um, earlier, I mentioned also the, the concept of helper classes. So the concept would be, my plugin class has to declare by looking at its signature what it's going to do. And me as a third party developer, I'm scanning for the method names to find out like what is important. But if I have about uh, 20 different um, methods that are all protected or private and starting with an underscore, then as a third party developer, I'm still tempted to read that code. While I actually I shouldn't because they're all starting with an underscore stating that those methods are not important. So if, if the plugin class has too many methods, it's becoming like spaghetti code. And if it's becoming spaghetti code, all of those helper methods could be offloaded to a helper class, making the code cleaner again. 
So that's why I refer to it as helper methods and helper classes. They're not really important. They're just helping the main functionality. And you, as a third-party developer, you can live and you can understand the code without actually understanding those helper parts. Um, different example, reCAPTCHA. Um, it's uh, the, the Google reCAPTCHA plugin. It's uh, contained, again, in the CAPTCHA plugin group. It, again, has an XML file and a PHP file. And now if we look at the signature, um, I'm again expecting to see whatever I've told you so far within the Joomla code. Um, unfortunately, I don't. So this is also to show you that uh, Joomla is written by um, human beings. Um, there's a plugin class. The plugin class is again starting with PLG, CAPTCHA to identify the group, and then reCAPTCHA is extending from J plugin. So this is always the same. This is what I call the plugin skeleton. You create a class name extending from J plugin without any methods, and that's your starting point. But if I look at the methods, they all start with on, but they are not starting with on CAPTCHA. So in other words, those events are not specific to CAPTCHA, but they are generic global events. The tricky thing is actually that on init is used here to initialize reCAPTCHA. But if I focus upon all of the plugins within Joomla, um, the on init method is also used by the editor plugins. It's also used by the, uh, the button plugins. Um, it's also used by the, the quick icon plugins. And they all do different things. So whenever I see on init, um, basically the method name, the signature of that method, doesn't tell me what is being initialized. And that's uh, really the downsides. I've, I've discussed this as well in, in the book. It's a couple of chapters long or a couple of pages long uh, describing that, that how uh, old legacy code actually leads to confusion. This is like bad code not following up to the standards of Joomla itself. Still, you can see the, the signature. Um, there's something called reCAPTCHA. And reCAPTCHA is part of JavaScript. It's a little bit of HTML. And then whatever you enter in the HTML code and whatever is being checked upon by JavaScript, it's being um, validated again in uh, the application itself to make sure that the CAPTCHA is correct. So that's, that's actually leading also to three different manage, uh, methods. On init to add JavaScript on display to generate HTML code, on check answer to validate actually whether the CAPTCHA is valid or, or not. And then the helper method is again specific for this kind of plugin. Um, now something completely um, different. Um, the system events, they are always like uh, diving a little bit deeper into how the system itself works. Um, understanding system events also requires you to understand how Joomla actually works. So what I already mentioned was on after initialize, that's going to be uh, the event that is generated right after Joomla has initialized its database, has initialized its, uh, its configuration, has loaded up the, the, the first pl plugins, and all of the plugins of uh, the type system, all of the system plugins are activated already. And then on after initialize, that's the first step. On after render, that's basically the final step. Um, and in between, there's this uh, on after dispatch, meaning that Joomla is in control of whatever needs to be done. But sooner or later, it's going to make a component responsible for what needs to be done. And that's the dispatching process. And when actually Joomla has given the comp component control of the page, then actually the event on after dispatch is being generated. So it's again like it's complicated and it's, it's more like advanced stuff to determine when these events become useful or not. To show you a little bit like how um, system plugins could combine multiple events, uh, I came up with this dummy code. It's a custom plugin, it's not doing anything uh, in real life. Um, but now you can see actually that there's a co on content prepare belonging to the content uh, plugin group. It's uh, containing on user authenticate, so that's the user uh, plugin group. And it's also on after initialized, meaning a system event. And because it's a system plugin, I don't need to do anything else except for just declaring those methods. And whenever that, that event on content prepare is being triggered, 
my plugin will be active and will be there to react upon it. Um, I've also uh, written down here the difference between protected and private. So protected means that whenever I create something protected, it's available to parent classes. Well, the, the parent class in this, in this case is JPlugin. Um, I'm, I'm pretty confident that whatever code I create as a third party developer, JPlugin is not going to use that. So for the parent, it's useless. But let's say that somebody else wants to extend from my own plugin, it might be useful. So uh, if I'm thinking that something is really generic and reusable for other developers, then I make my method um, uh, protected. And then if uh, something is so specific that I know for sure that it's like hackish and not reusable by anybody, I make it private. So again, private or protected are not just keywords that, that have certain features, but it's also a way of communicating. Now, um, let's move forward to a couple of examples of, of code that we can fit into those methods. And one of those uh, uh, examples is here JForm. Um, JForm is uh, the way that uh, forms are being generated in Joomla. That means in the front end, but that also means uh, in the back end. So whenever we're looking at some kind of form, uh, a module edit form, a content article form, um, a menu item edit form, then it's always a form generated through uh, JForm. And JForm is using its own XML mechanism to define whatever is translated into a real life form. And that could be looking like this. This is the definition of a form. Uh, within the form, it's expecting some kind of grouping of attributes, um, both in fields and a field set. Um, and then within the field set, you could add a new, uh, uh, a new field called test. And then if, if every time when I define something like a field, I need to accompany it with a name and label. The description is, uh, is, is uh, optional. Uh, and the type is whatever you want to create with that form type. So it could be uh, a type is text. It could be uh, a select form, uh, a list, a drop down form, um, a text area, and, and so on. Um, now, let's assume that I've created this in a subfolder of my plugin. So if I go back to one of the examples, so let's say that, that I'm going to do, uh, I'm, I'm going to extend JForm using this, uh, this folder structure or this class. And then it's a system class, or it's a system uh, plugin class, meaning actually that the location is going to be uh, plugins slash system slash, and then the name of my plugin custom slash custom.php, because that's the, the, the PHP file. And now, assuming that, that I'm going to create something with JForm, I'm going to place within the same plugin folder, I'm going to place a, a form uh, folder plus a form.xml file. So I know now that actually the XML is then part of my plugin structure. The next step would be actually be um, adding it to the right form. And the first step, I think, um, to, to deal with that is simply um, <laughs> copy and paste, see that it's working. Because it's two lines, it's really simple. Uh, there's this method. Whenever you create that method on content prepare form, it always has to have two arguments. Uh, so that's form and data. If you leave out one of these ver variables, it's going to generate an error. Um, and then actually the form, that's the one that you're looking for. Um, that's basically the object oriented way that the form will be generated. And that form object has a method called load file and the load file actually has a form uh, parameter, and this form parameter actually translates into form.xml. Um, this is the most basic of the examples, and it's pretty pointless if you put it into um, action, because um, the XML, let me go up, the XML is actually adding something to a field set called attrips, attributes. So whenever there's a form with an attribute field set my field uh, is going to be added to it on every page because I didn't really distinguish between is this the page of um, uh, the content article or the, the menu item edit form. 
or maybe it's in the front end and not in the back end. So actually, I didn't do any checks there, and that's where the, the code will be more elaborate. There's going to be checks whether actually this form object will be part of the form or will be actually be the right form. Another check that I, I uh, add a lot of times is whether the current application is the back end or the front end. There could be security checks. Uh, you could also use the data uh, variable, which is a copy of all the data that is being pushed into the form. So you could modify those data. You could simply check upon the data, whether it's a new uh, article or it's an existing article, stuff like that. Um, some more examples, um, adding CSS code. Uh, I'm, I'm still, again, referring to like the generic example of using a system plugin. But every time we, we, we look at one of these methods, we need to ask ourselves, is this going to be a system plugin or a user plugin or whatever? We know for sure that all of the on after, uh, or we know for sure that if our system plugin is or if our plugin is really a system plugin, that our system plugin is going to be initialized in the very beginning. And because of that, it will actually be initialized to interact with this method called on after initialize. To, so to make this work, I can't put it into a user plugin because our user plugin will not be active at this point, point in time. But if it's a system plugin, it will be initialized whenever this event on after, on after initialize is taking place. And then to add things to it, um, I simply pointed to a certain CSS folder, certain CSS file. And this, this is the code that you could also add to your own Joomla template. But instead of actually doing it in the Joomla template, now it becomes something of uh, a plugin. So one of the 10 use cases in the beginning would be like adding a jQuery uh, effect to something, to, to the page. It could be done using code like this. And there, there's a similar statement to add JavaScript as there is now with uh, style sheets. So this is like showing you slowly like what kind of code could, uh, could be in there. Hmm? Where is this example? Uh, look at the book, because the book is really full of those examples, and it's better organized also than, than the slides. I don't remember this one. Um, my, my, my GitHub repository is also full of a lot of code samples, but that's like a huge listing of a lot of different code. So then the book. The, the